Good morning. It's so nice to have you here. Welcome to South Church, Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, coming to you in virtual space as we continue to navigate these strange and creative times. I am Kirsten Hunter, the Director of Lifespan Ministries, and I'm so happy to welcome you today and to be leading our worship service today along with Myra Aronson, our worship associate, who I will introduce now to tell you a little bit more about the day. Good morning. So I am Myra Aronson, one of a team of eight worship associates who work with our ministers and wonderful staff to help create our Sunday services. Um, this morning, I would especially like to also thank in advance um, Susan Adams, who will be providing music for us and our guest, Mike Welch, who will be singing the invocation. And also Jen Del Deo will be providing the story for all ages. Enjoy the service. The South Church Social Justice Salvation Army Soup Kitchen Program will resume preparing meals for those in need on the second Saturday of each month, starting on July 11th. The need for prepared food has nearly doubled due to COVID-19, while fewer volunteer servers will be required. If you can offer to make some food for those less fortunate in our community, please email Kate Phelps at southchurchsoup at gmail.com for more information. Hi hey everybody, it's Ginny Cease from the Pocket Garden Tour again. Uh, this is, I guess, your weekly reminder to, if you haven't already, to uh, purchase a bloom that helps to uh, fund our Pocket Garden Tour every year and helps the church. So if you go on our website, uh, southchurchuu.org, I personally use the search function just now, typed in Pocket, you can type in Garden, um, and the page comes up on that, and at the bottom there's a Buy Now link. And there's a note. So what your note will say is for a bloom, it's either an honor of or in memory of someone or whatever you can do your business. You can write whatever you want, really. Um, and so I just did that. It's a PayPal link. So you can either use your PayPal account if you have one or there's a guest user uh, portal that you can use if you don't feel comfortable doing that. If you need to, you can call the church. I'm sure they can accept a check or cash where, well, you know, they can work it out. Um, and I'm happy to say this year I did it again for my uh, 102 year old grandmother. Virginia Cook in uh, honor of her because she's still living and she's my favorite gardener. Uh, so if you have any questions, just reach out to us and we're looking forward to seeing you. This, this year the Pocket Garden Tour is a little different. It's going to be in September 11th and 12th, a Friday, Saturday. So uh, we're hoping to see you there. Good morning. I'm Lauren Katz and I'm also from the Pocket Garden Tour with some additional information. Be ready to volunteer to be a garden sitter or help hanging up signs. Details are coming in the next few weeks. Also, cookies this year are going to be a bit different. So right now, instead of needing cookie bakers, we are in need of mask makers. People are going to be required to wear a mask as they enter each garden, and we would like to sell some beautiful floral fabric masks. So if you can help make some, that would be lovely. We can even provide elastic and fabric if that would help you. Just contact me at the email below and we will get you set up. 
Thanks so much. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best God, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence, my life. a journey, a journey which I didn't plan, a journey without a map. It started in 2017 when a hiring controversy at the UUA resulted in the appointment of a commission to examine structural racism and a movement to challenge white supremacy within the UUA. White supremacy? Come on. White supremacy, I thought, is about the Ku Klux Klan and Nazism. My Jewish grandparents left Eastern Europe to escape from oppression. What could white supremacy have to do with me? But that was then, and this is now. And for me, now, there is no denying the existence of white supremacy in our culture not just in the South, not just among those who oppose immigration or who commit violence, it's built into our culture and institutions. I don't know when or where the turning point was for me. As hate has been given license to come out of the dark corners, my awareness has been growing. As stories about black drivers being pulled over for a broken taillight and ending up in a morgue filled the news, as my awareness of the particular lessons that black parents must teach their children just to simply safely navigate a day, I've been forced to acknowledge my own white privilege. Compliments of white supremacy, I've never had to worry about those things. Last week, I attended several workshops in Zoomville, of course, dealing with collective liberation. One left me sobbing. And I've been reading the book, Waking Up White, and I'm thinking of buying a case of this book for friends and family, because a veil has been removed from my eyes. For one example, I learned that the GI Bill, designed to provide low interest home loans and pay for education and training for veterans returning from World War II, had written into it provisions to make it difficult, if not impossible, for Black people to get their benefits. Maybe you are not as ignorant as I, but I have been so challenged by what I'm reading that I can only read a little bit at a time. 
but I will not stop reading and watching and listening and learning. For I have come to a deep understanding on a visceral level that not racist is not the same as anti-racist. That white supremacy is in fact the right term to describe the privilege that white Americans enjoy, whether we seek the advantage or not. It's built into the system and that system causes spiritual injury to all of us, even those whom it is designed to benefit. I am not free as long as others are oppressed is not just a feel good phrase for a poster or bumper sticker. It is what collective liberation is all about. I can feel it now. What I will do about it is the next challenge. As I light the chalice in my home, I encourage you to light your own chalice, inviting light into your home and your heart. These words were written by Reverend Kristen Harper, minister at the UU Church in Barnstable, Massachusetts, and in 1999, only the second woman of African descent to be called to a UU church through the UUA settlement process. She says, each day provides us with an opportunity to love again, to hurt again, to embrace joy, to experience unease, to discover the tragic. Each day provides us with the opportunity to live. This day is no different this hour no more unique than the last, except maybe today, maybe now, among friends and fellow journeyers, maybe for the first time, maybe silently, we can share ourselves. And now please join me in reciting our mission statement as displayed on your screen. At South Church, we nurture spiritual growth through worship, learning, and community. We celebrate the worth and dignity of all people, and we inspire one another to act on our faith in the larger community. Good morning. My story for you today was inspired by listening to Kirsten and some kids talk during one of our classes a few days ago. I hope I can see you there really soon. So, once upon a time, there was a little town. Everyone did their regular things pretty peacefully. There wasn't a lot of fanciness or hubbub, no big drama, and all the days were pretty much kind of the same. This little town worked like a machine with lots of smoothly moving parts. Every person did what they were supposed to do and at the start of each day, the sun would go up and at the end of each day, the sun would go back down. Even though we know that's not really how the sun works, right? Just kind of seems that way. Well, one day, everyone was doing their regular thing as usual, but right around lunchtime, something really strange started to happen the light started to get really dim, even though there weren't any clouds in the sky. And the air got a little bit eerie. Everything got really quiet and the birds stopped singing. And it got pretty dark for being the middle of the day. The people in the town didn't know what was happening, but they each noticed an unfamiliar feeling in their bodies and especially in their brains. This new feeling was curiosity. The really odd thing that was happening with the sun made them want to know why it was happening. And that felt new because these people weren't typically very curious. So after a bunch more minutes, the light started to return, the birds started to sing again, and things seemed to return to normal. Only once it was done, there was a person there in the center of town who nobody had ever seen before. And the person stood out. They had hair that was really, really dark on one side and really, really light on the other, split right down the middle. 
and the hair came down over their face, it covered their eyes and their nose so that you could only see the mouth. The people got that new feeling thing again, curiosity. There was some kind of magic happening here. And the stranger reached into this big, colorful sack and pulled out an item and they placed it on the head of a man who was standing nearby. The man's eyes got wide. And he looked pretty nervous as the stranger placed this thing that covered his ears. But once it was in place, his expression changed. He started to smile and the smile got bigger and bigger and then happy tears started to pour down his cheeks. What this man was hearing was music and that was something this town hadn't had before. When the man heard the music in his ears, it flowed through his whole body and into his heart and even touched his very soul. It was so wonderful. Everyone watched the man, and when the song eventually ended, he took the thing off his head and he had a real look of joy on his face. Now, somehow during that time, the stranger had just vanished, but the big colorful bag was right there on the ground. Someone opened it and found a whole bunch more of those music makers inside. All the people got really excited to have these great things that the man had tried, and they took them all out of the bag but they realized there were only half as many music makers as there were people. Every person really, really wanted one, but only half of them could have them. Well, everyone knew who would get them and who wouldn't get them because there was a certain tradition around things like this in the town. They didn't really talk about it, they just obeyed it. Whenever there was not enough of something, the something went to certain people first. Order went by the size of the third toe on their left foot compared to the fourth toe on their left foot. If you'd asked, they couldn't have told you why it worked that way, but it had always been like that since any of them could remember. So there was no question about how the music makers were given out. The people who didn't get the music makers were so disappointed, but they knew that no matter how unfair it felt, this was just how it was. So the lucky owners of the music makers took what was theirs and were so excited to use them. They went to their homes, they put them on their heads and they laughed and cried and the music made them dance and it felt so amazing. The next day, everyone got back to doing their work or schooling, they each always did. And the people with the music makers took their music makers with them to be able to experience that joy while they did their work or their school. They put them on their heads, the sweet, sweet sounds filled their ears and their bodies, and they danced. But when they looked at the people who didn't have music makers, the music changed. It got staticky and less beautiful, and they couldn't feel that joy flowing through their hearts and into their souls. So they just looked away, and the sound would get a bit better. Not quite like that first time, but better. And at home when they were alone, the people with the music makers could absorb the music and move to it and feel happy. But when the people that didn't have music makers were around, it just didn't work. And that good feeling wasn't there. The people with the music makers got really protective of them and thought that the others were going to try to take them. And they blamed the others for the static that made the music makers not work well, even though the others hadn't done anything and they weren't going to take them. One day on the playground, there were some kids who owned music makers and they were talking about it. They knew that the fading of feelings wasn't the fault of the people who didn't have the music makers. They knew deep down that they just couldn't feel the joy in the music when they were keeping it for themselves, while for no good reason some of their neighbors didn't have access to that beauty. So that group of kids on the playground made a decision. They carefully cleaned up their music makers, they decorated them to look really extra special, and they each gifted their music maker to someone who didn't have one. And they apologized for having taken them in an unfair way in the first place. Well, 
this was a problem because the tradition that said who does and does not get things was made that's what made it okay for the townspeople to live the way that they did that's part of what made everything run like a smooth machine and mixing that up would be confusing and unpredictable and scary but the kids were courageous and they did it anyway they watched the new owners put the music makers over their ears and they watched how their smiles grew and the tears flowed and their bodies moved as the music made its way into those people's hearts and souls. And the children who had gifted away their music makers in watching this noticed something in their own selves. Their skin started to tingle and their hearts started to feel all sparkly and it made them giggle at this other new beautiful feeling. What they felt was the beauty of loving their neighbors and witnessing them feel the music. So these kids told the other people who had music makers about what happened. And the people had a hard time believing them, but the kids kept telling them the truth and the people with music makers decided to do what these children had done. They carefully cleaned up their own music makers, they decorated them nicely, and they gifted them to people who didn't have them. They apologized too for what had happened, even though they had only taken them originally because that was what they thought they were supposed to do. But they still apologized for the unfairness and the hurt that that had caused. And when they witnessed the smiles and joy tears and the dancing bodies of these new owners experiencing the music, they felt that same skin tingly, heart sparkly feeling of witnessing their neighbors experiencing the music. The new music maker owners enjoyed their experiences for a good long while. And it took a long time, but eventually all the people of the town together found a way to share the music makers in a way that kept the static away and felt fair. And eventually they all could experience the gifts of not only the music, but also the gifts of witnessing each other experience the music. And they started to exercise their curiosity muscles so that they could ask questions about why things were the way they were. And so they could keep getting better at finding ways to take care of each other. They decided that their toes were not a fair way to measure who deserved something. And like all exercise, it was hard work growing those muscles and it never ended either. But they saw how things got better the more they asked questions and the more they stayed curious about the ways to live honestly and kindly and in right relationship with each other. So we can all do this work together in our community too. It's not a sprint where we race as fast as we can to cross the finish line and be done with the job. For this work in front of us, we need to stay curious and exercise that curiosity in a way that keeps us moving forward always, growing our muscles, questioning why we do things the way we do them, and learning how to really make sure we take care of each other so we can all experience the joy of really loving our neighbors. It will take a very, very long time. I am right there exercising with you. See you soon. During the month of July, our collection will be shared with CASA, a volunteer organization supporting abused and neglected children. A video about this work will follow my words. As we take our collection, let us keep in mind this vision for Unitarian Universalism as written by the UUA Leadership Council in 2008. With humility and courage born of our history, we are called as Unitarian Universalists to build a beloved community where all souls are welcome as blessings and the human family lives whole and reconciled. May our efforts help this be so. The directions for giving online or via a check in the mail are on your screen. We need more CASAs because unfortunately, not every child that comes into the neglect and abuse system in the state of New Hampshire can be paired up with a CASA. These children need a hand. Uh, they need some guidance. Um, they need commitment for someone to stand by them and speak for them. And I think if more people understood that, we'd break the cycle of neglect and abuse more quickly. 
Having been a CASA, I have made an impact in the lives of neglected and abused children. That's a privilege. There are a lot of children out there that don't have a voice, and I feel like I can represent the best interests of children as a CASA advocate. Children are growing up in these homes that are dysfunctional and sometimes very dangerous. They need somebody in their life that hears them. When I met my CASA kid, she was 16 years old, and the first thing she said to me after I explained my role to her was, finally, somebody for me. Every case I'm given, my objective is to make a difference in the life of this child. I don't think I've ever done anything that is personally as fulfilling as uh, being a CASA. It was amazing to me how resilient these children can be. They just need some consistency and some people that care about them and, and are looking out for their best interests. And that's, I think, what CASA does. We always need more CASAs that, that come uh, forth like I did and spend a little time out of each month helping these kids. Good morning. As I invite you now into a time of prayer, we'll begin by sharing words written by Reverend Elizabeth Wen. This prayer is titled, Hope Does Dwell. God of mercy, spirit who makes peace out of war, who wanders with refugees and keeps vigil with children in our borders and all borders, Holy healer in hospitals and shelters, at schools, in homes, at weddings, and in plains. May your love be a balm for all the hurt. May your truth be present in offices of power and in the hearts of soldiers and civilians alike. Many times we've thought the ark was bending towards justice. Many times we saw it happen in courtrooms and in streets, in the hearts of people, creating their own liberation. Many times we've also doubted. For those of us this morning who doubt, who despair that brokenness and suffering and war may win, remind us of the small mercies, the tiny triumphs. Hope does dwell in this world. I invite you now to share a prayer in the chat box if you wish, to call out the name for anyone you'd like us to hold in our hearts and in our minds. You're also welcome to close your eyes and listen to the sound of moving water.
My brain has been a flurry of thoughts this week as I've been processing the UU General Assembly, annual gathering of Unitarian Universalists from across the continent that Myra mentioned in her opening words as well. She and I and several other South Church people spent many hours last week attending virtual worship services, business meetings, and workshops. And I wanna share with you that just like in the world at large, there is a lot happening in the larger UU faith community right now. There are bold leaders calling on Unitarian Universalists to make bold choices, calling on all of us to use our moral imaginations, to push ourselves out of our comfort zones, to try to imagine how we might do things differently, to engage, to talk less and listen more. This summer's theme at South Church is collective liberation. Reverend Susan and I decided to lift up this exploration a while back, but I can't imagine a better jumpstart than General Assembly to highlight its relevance and motivate me to start this conversation. I don't think it's news to any of you at this point that I believe our religion has significant potential to change the world for the better, that it holds a framework we can follow to grow toward realizing the beloved community. I cherish the ways that I see our South Church people already living toward that vision, but I suspect most of you also know we still have a long way to go. Right now, as we live in the time of COVID, as we live in the midst of another uprising for justice and equity, here in the United States and across the world, as families continue to be held in cages at our borders. All of our strengths as you use and all of our learning edges are so visible. It makes us raw. It offers us unusual opportunities for growth, but also carries the distinct possibility that we will fail to answer this call. Last week, Reverend Dr. Natalie Fenimore, a prophetic voice in our faith, talked about a need for some kind of shared mission across Unitarian Universalism. She reflected on the duality of our religious framework, how we are individuals and a part of communities, how UU congregations are each independent from the next and also connected, a part of a larger whole, there is room in our faith for plurality, complexity, nuance, individual identities, experiences, and definitely beliefs. But what is the glue that unites us, she asked. I think about that question a lot. It feels important that we as a collective have clarity on what holds us together this summer as we think about collective liberation, I would offer that it might be the glue, not a creed, but a mission that allows any one of us to move along with all of us, that recognizes and balances the duality of each of us as individuals, as well as all of us as a collective, that pulls together our shared principles and our collective theologies. Yesterday was the 4th of July. I usually spend the 4th of July on my family's farm in New York, although this year is not usual. I have always loved the 4th of July. Since I was a wee one, the farm celebration has felt like my family at our best. Laughter and sunshine and music and so many friends. A time when we can share the incredible piece of land that we are so lucky to own. When I was young, it felt like the purest of holidays. A day to celebrate the beginning of the USA, waving flags and barbecues. No gifts to worry about or complicated meals, not much ceremony, just pure celebration and fireworks. I love laying on the grass and looking up at the dark sky and watching the magic bursts of light break through the darkness. I love the gasps 
the intensity of sharing the experience with others. I love the trails of smoke that remain after the sparks disappear, the smell of sulfur in the air, the waiting, the building to a crescendo. I love the silence that follows and then the cheers. I share this with you because seeing all the perfection of July 4th feels like a perfect metaphor for the worldview of a white middle-class daughter in the United States. My parents who got their foothold in the world because their own parents had built a safety net beneath them, our family, fourth generation residents on this land, beneficiaries of migrant communities in New York City that welcomed my great grandparents as they arrived from Norway, who found work and housing in the Norwegian communities of Brooklyn, whose churches served as their first safety net here in the United States, who worked together to save enough to buy an apartment and then a whole apartment house, who benefited from the GI Bill and the wave of social services that came with the New Deal, who flourished generation after generation, embracing the belief, because it proved to be likely, that each new generation had a right to expect more than their parents who came before them, who did not speak about whose land they stood upon, who did not learn that the path to citizenship taken by their grandparents was not offered to all people in this great country, who did not know that while immeasurable resources were being poured into the homes of white U.S. families, black, brown, and indigenous families were intentionally and systematically prevented from receiving those injections of wealth and financial stability. Generation after generation, as the wealth of many white families grew, millions of US citizens were denied the same benefits. Physical enslavement did not end with abolition, it transformed into incarceration and economic enslavement. And the indigenous people who were here before any of us, whose land we stole because we did not recognize them as wholly human, were enduring a centuries long cultural genocide by the US government that arguably has not yet ended. On this day, July 5th in 1852, Frederick Douglass was invited to give a speech in Rochester, New York at an Independence Day event. The speech was a phenomenal example of what it means to speak truth to power. I can only imagine the waves it made on the day it was given. And it is a chilling indictment of our country to listen to the speech today and realize how much it still holds true. Perhaps some of you participated in the Black Heritage Trail reading of his speech here in Portsmouth this past Friday. If you missed it, it is airing on New Hampshire PBS tonight at 8.30. As Douglas began his speech, he told the audience that he had respect for the writers of the Declaration of Independence. They were statesmen patriots and heroes, and for the good they did and the principles they contended for, he said, I will unite with you to honor their memory. In other words, there he saw there was a framework from the very beginning of our country that was rooted in a noble vision. Frederick Douglass saw it and I can see it. We teach our children that those principles guide us. But then Frederick Douglass asked a very important question. Why am I called upon to speak here today, he asked. What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? In 1852, he asked that question. And the answer then was most certainly no. Black Americans at that time were not extended the great principles of political freedom and natural justice. 
100 years later, in 1952, the answer was still most certainly no. My mother was a child at that point, moving to Long Island from Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. I wonder if she knew that the parkway they drove on to get from Mayaya Papa's home in Brooklyn to her new house in Glen Head was built on purpose with very low overpasses in order to prevent buses from traveling out from the city. Robert Moses, a man who had more influence on the design of a metropolis than possibly any other person in history shared with our founding fathers the same narrow definition of who was meant to be served by those great principles of political freedom and natural justice in our country, and who was not. In 1977, when my parents moved us to our farm further out on Long Island, they moved to a community that was almost entirely white, by design, by intentional policies, preventing Black families from getting loans to buy a home, from explicit covenants that prevented Black families from being allowed to buy homes in many communities in order to keep them exclusively white. Racism and a belief in white supremacy framed everything. In the mid-1990s, I moved to New Mexico for college. I received my bachelor's degree from UNM and stayed on to earn my master's degree in education while teaching in the South Valley of Albuquerque. The decade I spent in New Mexico was formative. New Mexicans hold a culture and a history that is very different from New York and New England. Many New Mexican families can trace their heritage on that land back 500, 600 years or more. Our national efforts to eradicate indigenous communities were devastating for indigenous New Mexicans as they were for indigenous people everywhere. But they've had less time to destroy the culture of New Mexico. It only became a state in January of 1912, six years before my grandmother was born in Brooklyn. Living there was my first real awakening to the myths I had been raised to believe. It was the first time I experienced being in spaces where white people were not the majority. It was the first time I re regularly heard a language other than English spoken without translation provided to me. It was the first time I found myself in stores and didn't know the use of some things on the shelves. And still, even there, people were segregated by design. In the 1990s, almost all white residents in Albuquerque lived in the northeast quadrant of the city with a small pocket of them around UNM campus and the Air Force Base in the southeast. The South Valley, the southwest quadrant of the city was 98% Hispanic and indigenous. And yet our staff team at Via Vista Elementary School in the middle of the South Valley was majority white and teacher vacancies were a permanent issue. I became the head of our special education department in 1999, two years after stepping into my first classroom ever. I should not have had that job. I did not have the experience for that job, but no one else was there to do it. How does that serve the children of our country? Who does it benefit? Our annual 4th of July that celebration in 2003 was one month after I moved back to New York from New Mexico. My son Keelan was three years old. My marriage had failed and I was in that liminal space that comes during big life changes. I was so happy to be gathering with beloved friends and family on the hill of our farm, so happy to be held in that community. But the 4th of July had lost some of its luster for me. It would be years before I heard Frederick Douglass's speech, but already I was awakening to the fact that our, what our country could be, what I thought we were, had not been realized. To use the metaphor of Jen Del Deo's story this morning, the music that used to make me so joyful was now filled with static. And then something holy happened. 
Leading up to the 4th of July celebration in 2003, my family came up with an idea to synchronize our fireworks display with music. I think my brother Ben was the originator of this plan, which makes sense because he lives and breathes music. I can't remember exactly how the conversation went, but I do remember that we decided to also have a speech, a welcoming message to be offered to the crowd before the first sparks would fly. You see, by this point, our family's farm had become a fixture in our community. The first 4th of July celebrations with dear friends had become something larger. In recent years, as dusk fell, nearly 200 people in our community arrived at the farm to watch the fireworks. And so we were brainstorming about how to take this fireworks display to a new level. And so I found myself ghostwriting a speech that would be given by my father at the start of the show. And I honestly didn't know it at the time, but in that opportunity, year after year, I found a way to enter into a new relationship with the 4th of July. I used that platform to have a dialogue with hundreds of people gathered on that hill, acknowledging that the vision of our great country was still just that, a vision. It's something we needed to continue to work toward through reconciliation and reparation. My dad and then eventually my mom who took over giving the speech used their relationship to those neighbors to invite them to join in a more honest celebration, a celebration of hope, unity, and potential, as much about what might be yet to come as it was about what already had come to be. It was in the tiniest of ways, a step toward collective liberation, a step toward recognizing that we are not just one story, that in order to celebrate the 4th of July, we have to name the harm of it all. We have to apologize. We have to reckon with all that we are. If we don't do so, the static becomes overwhelming. The watermelon loses its sweetness. The corn on the cob doesn't snap in the same way. The sparklers don't shine. To move toward collective liberation, those of us with privilege have to give some things up. Reverend Fenimore last week made this point and I deeply appreciate it. Some people have benefited by the way things have been, she said. We are asking some people to exchange one benefit for another. I love remembering that it's an exchange. Collective liberation isn't about sacrificing yourself for others, it's about exchanging the current benefits that only some of us feel for something better. In his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, Ibram X. Kendi touches on this as well in the chapter, White. Of course, he writes, white people benefit from racist policies and more so racist power, but not nearly as much as they could from an equitable society, one where the average white voter could have as much power as super rich white men to decide elections and shape policy, where their kids' business class schools could resemble the first class prep schools of today's super rich, where high quality universal health care could save millions of white lives, where they could no longer face the cronies of fascism that attack them, sexism, ethnocentrism, homophobia, and exploitation. There is a reason so many people with power in our country spend so much time creating divisions between people and why they spend so little time helping us envision a more equitable society. But they're not the boss of us. The good news, says Reverend Sophia Betancourt, is that we are in control of what we do with our daily living. If we, each one of us represent a missing remnant in the fabric of our collective future. Then together, we can lean into a possibility 
that we have yet to fully experience in human history, a collective wholeness, an unassailable good. That is the kind of salvation I'm here to fight for in the small moments of every single day. May it be so. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. When we made it back home, back over those curved roads that wind through the city of peace. We stopped at the doorway of dusk as it opened to our homelands. We gave thanks for the story, for all parts of the story, because it was by the light of those challenges we knew ourselves. We asked our forgiveness. We laid down our burdens next to each other. <laughs>